Well, good morning. Good morning and welcome to First Baptist Oakers on this uh, second Sunday of uh, January in 2021. It's, uh, it, it's been an interesting uh, new year, huh? Uh, well, our welcome and call to worship is going to come from Psalm 93. Psalm 93, we'll begin reading in verse 1. So Psalm 93, verse 1. As you're turning there, uh, uh, two announcements. One is that uh, we're not going to be having our council meeting this Tuesday. Uh, we are in the process of, of looking at kind of updating the sanctuary's paint. And uh, so we're waiting for uh, that, that kind of report from that group that was working on that. So hopefully we'll have council meeting at the end of the month once we get kind of the final number. So um, if you're very opinionated about paint, make sure you uh, keep your opinions to yourself. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, we'll, we'll have some more to report as far as, uh, as, uh, as the colors and everything uh, eventually. So I'm, a, I'm looking forward to it. It's, I'm excited about it. And so I hope you will be too. And... Uh, uh, just a, another announcement, as you see in the little bulletin handout on your seat back in front of you, uh, just again, thank you guys so much for your uh, generosity over this last year. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we made a video and emailed it and posted it on our Facebook page, just highlighting the numbers, uh, the numerous areas that we were able to just help. And so I just wanted to highlight a couple over the next coming weeks. Uh, I'm not going to do all... Was it like seven of them that I did in the video? But over the next couple of weeks, I just want to highlight a couple of the, the things that we've been able to do as a church over this last year. Uh, uh, one of them, uh, of course, the big one is that we have we gave in in, in 2020 we gave over twenty four thousand dollars to various missions work. And uh, so praise the Lord. I mean, think about think about all that that we went through last year. And yet, God has been faithful, and we've been able to continue to give sacrificially for the advancement of the gospel. So, let's praise the Lord for that. And as we look forward to this new year, uh, let's continue to sacrifice for the sake of the Great Commission. So, uh, with that in mind, let's turn our attention to God's Word. The Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord, Yahweh, is robed. He has put on strength as His belt. Yes, the, the world is established. It shall never be moved. Your throne is established from of old. You are from everlasting. The floods have lifted up, O Lord. The floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their roaring, mightier than the thunders of many waters, mightier than the waves of the sea. The Lord on high is mighty. Your decrees are very trustworthy. Holiness befits your house, O Lord, forevermore. Let's pray. Father, we come before you, and God, we thank you that in the midst of the this situation in which we find ourselves today, this, this year that in which we live, Lord, we thank you that you are reigning, that you are ruling over all, that uh, your throne is established from everlasting to everlasting, Lord, you are God. And so, Lord, we thank you for the hope that we have because of your Son, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Would you please uh, stand and join us in sing?
stand? Would you turn your Bibles with me to Psalm 78? Psalm 78. And as you are turning there, uh, remember last week we uh, uh, I kind of gave a, a brief outline of what we're going to do over the next couple of weeks. So this week, uh, as it's the new year, we're starting... Some of us are starting, hopefully many of us, and if you haven't now, you can have 10 days to catch up a new reading plan in the Bible. Uh, I just wanted to kind of equip you to be able to understand the, the entirety of the Bible as you dive in. So this week is going to be one sermon on the entirety of the Old Testament. Uh, yes, I know that's a lot to take in. Uh, and then next week will be an overview of the New Testament. And then, Lord willing, the following week after that, we'll finally start our series on the life of Elijah. So... With that in mind, we'll look at Psalm 78. I'm not going to read the entire Old Testament and make you stand for it. I'm not going to read the entire Psalm 78 either, uh, because it is, it's got 72 verses. But this uh, psalm, if you have time the rest of today, uh, I'd encourage you to read it. It's kind of an overview of the history of Israel in the Old Testament. But for the sake of our time, I'm just going to dive in. We'll just read starting in verse 1. God's word says, Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from of old, things that we have heard and known that our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, but, to, but tell to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. Thank you very much. You may be seated. Let's pray. Father, we come before you now, and God, we are so grateful for your word that you have given to us. God, that you have revealed yourself to us in. So Lord, I, I ask that as we look at the, the story of the Old Testament, the history of the Old Testament, what it teaches us about you and how it points us forward to the coming redemption, the coming Messiah, the coming Savior that we have in Jesus Christ. Father, help us to understand. And as we read your word, may our hearts truly burn within us because of how incredible it is that you did not spare your Son, your only Son, for us. Lord God, I ask now that you be glorified through the preaching of your word so that every heart might confess that Christ is Lord. And pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Is the Bible, especially the Old Testament, still relevant for us today? Is it still important for us today? What do so many of these stories in the Old Testament have to do with us? Think, for instance, of 2 Kings chapter 2. I'm going to be going through a lot of verses today, so if you can make it, I'm not going to wait for you, but if you can make it, go for it. Uh, try and keep up. 2 Kings, think of 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 23. 2 Kings 2, verse 23, it's telling about uh, Elisha. He went up from there to Bethel. While he was going up on the way, some small boys came out of the city and jeered at him, saying, Go up, you bald head. Go up, you bald head. And he turned around, and when he saw them... He cursed them in the name of the Lord, and two she-bears came out of the woods and tore 42 of the boys. What in the world does the story of Elisha and these bears and these boys in ancient Israel have to do with us today, especially in modern America? We live in a day when Christians profess to love and appreciate the Bible, but it seems like that love doesn't go much further than displaying the Bible on a coffee table. We live in a day where teenagers in the church who grew up in the church know less about the Bible than their parents did. And that's a trend that's likely going to continue. And so young people, I ask you here this morning, is that trend going to continue with you? Or are you going to reverse that trend? Every year, uh, Ligonier... Ministries and Lifeway Research, they do a survey. And this survey is called the State of Theology. They send out a number of questions all over the, the United States, and they ask all sorts of questions about theology and the Bible and 
what you believe about God and salvation. And, and, and I find this survey every year to be fascinating. Fascinating because it's so discouraging on the one hand. And one of the most discouraging trends, they've asked this question over the last, I think, five or six years. They've asked this question, is one of the trends is in response to the statement, the Bible, like all sacred writings, contains helpful accounts of ancient myths, but is not literally true. How would you answer that? The Bible, like all sacred writings, contains helpful accounts of ancient myths, but is not literally true. How would you answer that question? Is it true that the Bible is just made up of myths that are untrue? Well, 48% of the people who were asked that question said that the Bible was not truthful and it was full of myths. And that trend, I think five years ago, it was about 41%. And so you've seen over the last couple of years, more and more people saying that they believe the Bible is not true and that it's just a bunch of myths. Friends, as, as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, and, and at, at this church, we believe, we say in our statement of faith that we believe the Bible is truth without any mixture of error. Christians typically, historically, have been people of the book, people of the Bible. But are we really? Biblical illiteracy, so uh, not understanding the Bible, not knowing the Bible, is not just an issue that's outside of the church. It's inside of it as well. Uh, although many people claim to be followers of Jesus, they, they don't know the Bible. They don't read the Bible. The average churchgoer, I'm not saying somebody who answers that they're a Christian on a, some survey. The average churchgoer, so the person who goes to a, a church regularly, they maybe read the Bible just a couple times a week. Yes, we can quote certain passages of Scripture. We can quote Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. We can, call, we can quote Psalm 23, The Lord is my shepherd. We can quote Genesis 1, 1, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. But do we really know how those passages of Scripture fit into the overall story of the Old Testament? Think of that, uh, of that verse there in Jeremiah 29. For I know the plans I have for you. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future, declares the Lord. It's a nice verse. It's a great passage of Scripture. Maybe you've got it on one of your uh, pillows at home. I'm not saying you need to go out and burn it by any means today. But this verse was not written to wealthy people in the United States that God just wants to make you more rich. It was written to the exiled people of God. They're, they're, they're not prospering by any means. They're actually in exile. They've been disobedient to God. They've been taken away from their homes. They're, they're in a foreign nation. They're, 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 the country that they're from, the homes that they grew up in, they are in ruins. One, uh, one, one professor put it this way. We have been trained to be Bible quoters, not Bible readers. So today, brothers and sisters, friends here today, today and this year, I challenge you to not just be a Bible quoter, but a Bible reader. So much of this problem that we see of, of, of an inability to understand it, a biblical illiteracy, an inability to know the Bible, it starts with our disregard of the Old Testament. So today, here's what we're going to do. We're going to answer some questions. First of all, we're going to look at why should we study the Old Testament? How do we study the Old Testament? What are uh, some sections of, what are the major sections of the Old Testament? What are some major themes of the Old Testament? In about 10 minutes, I'm going to give you an overview of the Old Testament, and then we'll end with some application. So buckle up. We've got 39 books and a couple thousand years to get through today. So first of all, why study the Old Testament? Well, as we think about why should we study the Old Testament, well, let's think about what are some common objections that people have to the Old Testament? Why are so many people hesitant to read the Old Testament? I, I think one that, that might come to mind is that some people think it's, it's boring. There, there's a long list of genealogies. There's hard to pronounce names and places. It's, 
it's hard to read. Sometimes it can be maybe confusing to understand all that's going on. Other people say it's not relevant. It, it contains lots of things that we don't observe today. Like the wearing of sackcloth and ashes. When was the last time you did that? Or as we read from 2 Kings chapter 2, the Elisha and the bears. What do these stories have to do with me today? Well, Randall, I'm going to start off by saying I have everything to do with you. If you are a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, then this is your history. This is your family story. These are the ones that we call our, our uh, forefathers and foremothers in the faith. This is your history as well. So why should we study the Old Testament? Yes, there's objections that people have. And I'll be honest, sometimes it is hard to read different sections of the Old Testament, right? I think it's okay for us to recognize that. Yes, people have objections. And even many, well, even some well-known people like uh, Andy Stanley said this of the Old Testament, that we must unhitch ourselves from the Old Testament. Believers today must unhitch ourselves from the Old Testament. In one sense, he's saying we kind of need to move on from it. We need to abandon it. Why would somebody say that? Well, why should we, in light of some famous <coughs> pastor, study the Old Testament? Because the Old Testament is invaluable, friends. It's, it's God's Word. If we abandon it, if we unhitch ourselves from it, we're actually abandoning God's revelation of Himself. So the first reason why we study the Old Testament is that it's God's Word. Uh, I mean, I know that's a shocker, right? <laughs> Revolutionary. But turn with me real quick, if you can keep up. 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. So why do we study the Old Testament? We study it because it's God's Word. 2 Timothy 3. We'll begin reading in verse 14. And read on down to verse 17. Paul's writing to Timothy, the Apostle Paul's writing to Timothy there. He says, But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good Word. See what Paul says about the Bible there? He says that he calls it sacred scripture. All scripture. All scripture and sacred scripture. What is he referring to there? What sacred scriptures is Paul writing about? Well, at the time that Paul is writing, he's referring to the Old Testament. The New Testament hasn't been fully completed yet, but the Old Testament was. And he says the Old Testament is able to make one wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. So, He's saying that it is sacred scripture. The Old Testament also was Jesus' Bible. Jesus often quotes from it. He alludes to it. He explains it. Ultimately, we'll see he fulfills it. In Matthew chapter 23, he speaks about the entire Old Testament. In Matthew 23, verse 34, Jesus says, Therefore I send you prophets and wise men and scribes, some of whom you will kill and crucify, and some of some." You will flog in your synagogues and persecute from town to town, so that you may come uh, all so that you may come all the righteous blood shed on earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the sanctuary and the altar. Truly I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. Now, what Jesus is doing here is he is showing us the entire Old Testament. He mentions Abel, Abel uh, from Genesis four, the very beginning of the Old Testament. And he's saying all the way through to Zechariah. What Jesus is doing here is he's teaching us that he believed the Old Testament, the entirety of it. Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, is killed in 2 Chronicles chapter 24. At the very end of the Hebrew Old Testament. So the Hebrew Old Testament, it's arranged differently. So that Chronicles, 2 Chronicles is the last book of the Old Testament. So what he's saying here is from the beginning to the end. He's showing us that's his Old Testament. That's what he believes to be the Word of God. From the beginning to the end, the Old Testament is God's Word. Think with me as well what he says about it in Matthew chapter 5. Matthew 5, verses 17 and 18. Jesus says, Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. 
For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass away from the law until all is accomplished. In other words, Jesus is saying, He didn't come to abolish it, meaning destroy it, do away with it, but to what? To fulfill it. So when we read the Old Testament, we gain a greater understanding of Jesus, of, of what He has come to do, of, of how, and how and why we must be saved from our sins. If the Old Testament were unimportant for us, Jesus would have said, I've come to abolish it. Why is it that we don't sacrifice today? Why don't, why don't we sacrifice animals today? Well, because we see that Jesus came to fulfill all of those Old Testament sacrifices. So first reason, the Old Testament is God's Word. And to try and, 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 and do away with it is to miss out on what God has revealed to us. So the Old Testament is God's Word. But second of all, why we study the Old Testament, why we should study the Old Testament, is because it helps us understand the whole story. It helps us read the Bible in color. I am just old enough to remember my family's first TV having a button on the side that you could press that would change the picture from color to black and white. Some of you I know experienced the first black and white TVs. I'm not, I'm not that old. But I remember being able, as a kid, to be able to press a button where you could move from black and white to color. Why would anybody not want to have color? I have no idea. But that's what the Old Testament is like. It helps us read the entire Bible, especially the New Testament, in color. Think of it this way, friends. If you were to start reading the Lord of the Rings series, would you begin with the third book? Would you begin with the return of the king? No, right? That you would read the very first one in that series. You would read the Fellowship of the Ring, then the Two Towers, and then the return of the king. I'm sure, yeah, if you started to just read the third book in the series, yeah, you could kind of piece together who Frodo was or what his mission was or that orcs are bad, or, but you wouldn't understand the whole story. You see, that's what we would be doing if we, would be, if we unhitched ourselves from the Old Testament. Why must Jesus suffer and die? Well, if we haven't read Genesis 3, Leviticus 16, Isaiah 53, then we don't fully understand why Jesus must suffer in our place. Why is there death? Why is there sin in the world? Why is there suffering in the world? The Old Testament explains why in Genesis that, that man has rebelled against his creator. So the Old Testament tells us the beginning of God's plan of redemption. Why redemption, why salvation is even needed. It helps us explain the sin and it helps us understand why the world is broken and, and why bad things so that's why. Yes, there's countless other reasons why. But first of all, we need to start with that understanding that the Old Testament is God's Word. That it is inerrant, it's infallible, it's able to make us wise unto salvation. And it helps us see and understand the whole story. So now, the, the second major question is, how do we study the Old Testament? How do we study? Well, most... Uh, uh, Bible interpretation classes will cover that there are three contexts or three situations, three backgrounds that help us read and study and understand the Old Testament. The first one is the literary context. Simply put, for those of you who have not had an English lesson this millennium or this past decade or further, the Bible is literature, meaning it's a book. Yes, it's God's inspired and inerrant book, but it's also literature, right? And what kind of literature affects the way we understand it? Think of it. Think of it this way. The Psalms. Do we read the poetry in the Psalms in the exact same way that we read the historical narrative in the sections of Genesis? Well, yes and no. Right? There are going to be some differences. Do you read poetry in the same way you read a magazine or you read a history book? Well, yes and no. There's differences, right? There are different literary genres of the Old Testament. You have narrative, you have covenant and laws, you have poetry, you have psalms, you have proverbs, you have prophecy, you have apocalypse. The genre, the type of, uh, of, of literature you are reading will help you understand how to better interpret the text we are in. 
think of it this way. You read the book of Daniel. And Daniel has these incredible visions, right? Kind of hard to understand. Visions about the future. You're going to read those visions differently than you read the narrative account of Daniel in the lion's den, right? So, first of all, there's that literary context. What am I reading? Am I reading a psalm? Or am I reading uh, the account of Joseph in, the, in, the, in prison? How you read that, the imagery used, is going to affect the way we understand the Bible. Second of all, there's a historical context. Friends, the Old Testament is real history. It's a real history of real people. So understanding the historical background will help us understand the story better. It'll help us read in color, right? Think of how the historical background of Ruth. Remember, uh, we were in Ruth a couple weeks ago, and, and how that historical background of her being a Moabite helps us understand just how incredible it is that a foreign woman is the great-grandmother of the greatest king of Israel. So the historical background. And, and, and I just want to uh, take a moment and just say, you know, that's why I think it's incredibly helpful to have a really good study Bible that points those things out. The, the study Bible I use literally every week, almost every day, is the ESV study Bible. Now, it's not a Bible you carry around with you because it's like 50 pounds, but it's a good one to put on your desk or wherever you read. It helps you understand some of the historical background. So I use the ESV study Bible. I, I, some of my professors help contribute to it, so I, I trust it. There's the NIV study Bible. I know there's the CSB study Bible. There's a number of helpful resources available so that we can better understand the historical context, the historical background of the Old Testament. Third, there's the theological context. Theology is literally the study of God. So the Bible is not just a story. It's not just an historical account. Its aim is to teach us, to teach us about God, to teach us, as Paul wrote, to make us wise unto salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, it's historical. Yes, it's true. But that history teaches us about who God is. It teaches us about what he has done. The Bible teaches us about God. And friends, I think one of the best questions we can ask of every text we're reading what is this teaching me about God? Get that question impressed upon your brain as wherever you're reading in the Old Testament, New Testament, what is this teaching me about God? What's he, if the Bible is God's revelation of himself to us, then what is this text teaching me about him? So, how do we do that? Understand the literary context, the historical context, the theological context. Next, moving on to the sections of the Old Testament. There are different groupings of the books of the Old Testament. You have, first of all, the Pentateuch, the first five. It's Genesis through Deuteronomy. You have the historical books of Joshua through Esther. You have the wisdom or poetic books of Job through the Song of Solomon. You have the prophetic books of Isaiah through Malachi. There's different sections of the Old Testament, and it's helpful to know what section you're in, right? Are you going to read Song of Solomon? the same way you're going to read uh, the Exodus account? No, there's a lot of imagery, right? There's different things that the writers are doing there. So let's move on now to themes of the Old Testament. What are some major themes of the Old Testament? The first one, God. <laughs> yes, I know that's obvious, right? The sky is blue, isn't it? Yes. In some instances, grass is green for the most part. This winter right now. God is a major theme of the Old Testament. The fact is that the Bible is God's revelation of himself from beginning to end. The Bible shows us who God is. It starts off in the beginning. What? In the beginning, God. Friends, that's truly incredible. God has revealed himself to us. Instead of leaving us on our own or, or wiping us out, he provided this revelation of himself. The Bible is God's revelation revealing himself to us, and it begins in the Old Testament. Now, this is important to understand, friends. The Bible is not man's or woman's musings about God. The Bible is not man or woman's 
uh, thoughts, random thoughts about God. No, it's purpose. It comes from God. It is God revealing himself to us. That's an important distinction. There are those who deny the truthfulness of the, the authority of God's word, and they start with that premise that it's just man's thoughts about God. But that's not what the Bible is. The Bible is God revealing himself to us. His character, his nature, and his care for his people. Another important thing of the Old Testament is covenant. A covenant is a binding promise. It's an unbreakable commitment between two parties. We don't really have very many covenants today, right? The closest thing we get today to a covenant would be the marriage covenant. But, any, but even today, many people think that it's just a piece of paper that can be broken. But that is not what it's meant. That is not what a covenant is. It is an unbreakable commitment to each other. You have a number of covenants throughout the Old Testament. You have God's covenant, first of all, with Noah. In Genesis 6, verse 18, you have the first uh, use of the word covenant. God says, but I will establish my covenant with you. My unbreakable bond, my unbreakable commitment with you, and you shall come into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, your sons' wives, with you. This covenant that God makes with Noah is that he's going to save him, and that he's also never again going to destroy the earth through flood. You have God's covenant through Abraham, to Abraham, Genesis 12, 15, 17. God promised that he's going to bless Abraham, and that through Abraham's descendants, he's going to make them numerous as, as the sands in the seashore, and through his descendants, all of the families of the earth will be blessed. Another covenant you have is, is the covenant at Sinai. The covenant that God makes with Moses. It's sometimes called the Mosaic Covenant. Say that really fast at lunch today. Mosaic Covenant. At Mount Sinai, God gave people the law. But before he did that, what did he do? He rescued them from slavery, right? And so he rescues them from Egypt. He brings them out. He gives them the law. He says, I'm going to be your God. You're going to be my people. And then he says, this is what the stipulations are going to be. This is what this commitment is going to look like from you and me. I'm your God. Now this is what it's going to look like to follow me. I saved you. Now faithfully obey and follow me. So Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, they provide the stipulations of that covenant. If they follow God, ultimately, God says what? I'm going to bless you. If you disobey me, you're going to be cursed. Then you have in 2 Samuel 7, God's covenant with David. And that covenant is that he is going to have a descendant who will be king forever. His throne will be established for all eternity. And now turn with me to Jeremiah 31. In Jeremiah 31, we have another covenant. There's five major covenants. Some say there might be a covenant in Genesis 1 and 2, but... Maybe there is, maybe there isn't. The word covenant isn't used until Genesis uh, 6 in my mind, so I don't know. I mean, I, I think maybe there is. Now we're just getting into a huge debate that, I mean, frankly, you don't need to concern yourself with. Is there a covenant with creation at the beginning or not? So, well, that's just, sorry. I just think about that a lot this week, and I just dumped that on you. Uh, <laughs> all right, so let's look at the new covenant. So five major covenants for sure. The fifth one being the new covenant. This covenant is kind of hinted at all throughout the prophets of the Old Testament. There, there's this, there's this, there's something else that's coming. And what is it? It's the new covenant. Je Jeremiah 31, verse 31. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. It's important. You see that? They broke it. God didn't break it. They broke it. For this is a covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God. They shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. So there is this promise. You see that in the Old Testament. There is this promise of a new covenant coming. Next week we'll see how Jesus is the fulfillment. He is the beginner, the bringer of this new covenant. So covenants all throughout the Old Testament. This commitment, this progressive, I guess, revelation and once it's God revealing himself through these covenants closer and closer and closer to now the new covenant in which we live today. 
Another major theme of the Old Testament is kingdom. God created the world. He rules over the world. He sustains the universe. But man in his sinful rebellion turned against God, rejected his rule. And so the story of Scripture then tells how the universe is God's kingdom. And despite our sin, God has established his rule and his reign. And the entirety of the biblical story is showing us how God's kingdom is being restored. And one day, as we read in Revelation at the very end, fully and finally it will be restored. Another major theme in the Old Testament is the theme of worship. Throughout the Old Testament... How do we obey? How do we praise? How do we glorify our King? It's through God-honoring and God-centered worship. A fifth theme in the Old Testament is the theme of the Messiah, of the Deliverer. All throughout the Old Testament, beginning at Genesis 3, verse 15, where God promises that one day He's going to send a Deliverer who's going to crush the head of Satan. All throughout the Old Testament, there is this hope of a Deliverer, a Messiah, literally a Savior to come. So there's this hope of one to come. From the very beginning, throughout the Old Testament, this hope increases. With each major character of the Old Testament, the question that is asked, is this the Messiah? Was it Noah? Was it Abraham? Was it David? No, no, no. They all failed. They all sinned. This messianic hope that's evident throughout the Old Testament is this hope for deliverance, this hope for salvation, this hope for redemption. And it cannot come from a human sinner. It must come from God Himself. And so that hope is evident all throughout the Old Testament. And it's fulfilled in Jesus alone. God and man. Fully God, fully man. Who came to take away the sin of the world. Who would suffer and die for your sins. But who would rise victorious from the dead. This hope for salvation and this hope for deliverance is all throughout the Old Testament. And is ultimately fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. So those are... Five major themes of the Old Testament. Again, I know there's more. If you can think of some more, go ahead and write them and email me. Email them to me this afternoon. How about that for homework? Or think about them around your dinner table. What are some other important themes that you see all throughout the Old Testament? All right. Now for an overview of the Old Testament. Think of it this way. When we think of like the, the big picture of the Old Testament, the big picture of God's story of Revelation, think of it this way. There's four parts to it. Creation, fall, redemption, and new creation. When you're reading the Bible, think about where you're at in that grand narrative, that grand story, these four parts of God's revelation. Creation, so Genesis 1 and 2 up to 3, where a fall, Genesis 3. Redemption would be Genesis 3 all the way up to like Revelation 21, right? Where God is redeeming for himself, saving for himself a people, and then new creation. So the new heavens and the new earth that's going to come one day. Creation, fall, redemption, new creation. So where are we at? Where are we at today in that grand story? Well, we're in the redemption period, right? In which God is redeeming for himself a people from every tribe and tongue and nation. He would call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. So let's dive in. 39 books. In five minutes. <laughs> Let's look at Genesis 1, verse 1. I know many of you can probably quote it from the top of your head. So Genesis 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Very beginning. So here we're looking at the historical overview, the, the overview of the Old Testament. So we're kind of, we looked at the creation, fall, redemption. Think of that as like a 30,000 foot view of God's story. Now we're kind of getting a little bit lower, maybe like 28,000 feet, right? This is where we're going to go right now. Maybe 16,000 feet overview of the Old Testament. Genesis 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God. God did what? He created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, you have nothing, and then you have something. Nothing can't just produce something. Unless you're God. You have nothing and then God speaks and the world comes into existence. What we have is God's miraculous creation. He creates life. He creates creatures. He makes man and woman in His image. That's very important. Genesis 1 and 2. He says that man and woman, He created them in His image. God's image. 
Meaning that, that man and woman, humanity is his prized creation. And, and Adam and Eve, their place in the garden, it's perfect, it ends very good. In the story, no. We have Genesis 3, where we have the fall. So then we have the fall of Genesis 3. Sin creeps in. In the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, they rebel against God. Sin enters the world, and along with sin, we have all of the brokenness that comes with sin. We have death, we have sickness, we have dying, disease, we have murder, everything that comes with it. Why do we die? Why do we need to repent of our sins and trust in the Deliverer? Because of Genesis 3. Because we are all sinners. But yet, even though Adam and Eve sinned against God, look with me at Genesis 3, verse 15. God says there, he's speaking to the serpent, he's speaking to Satan. He says, I'll put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring, and he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. You see that from the very beginning, this is sometimes called the first gospel, meaning the first uh, example of good news, the first promise of good news to come. Even though Adam and Eve sinned against God, even though they have... They have uh, been separated from God. He has this promise here that I'm going to send a deliverer. So that promise, that hope, right? The Messiah, that hope right there is from the very beginning. Instead of wiping them out, he promises that one day he's going to send a deliverer. Well, you read on in Genesis 4, it gets better, right? No. What happens right after Genesis 3? You have a brother kill his brother. And then as you go on in the story of Genesis, and humankind gets worse for many generations. As a result, God judges the world through flood, but He spares one righteous man, Noah and his family. Starts over. But the problem is that after Noah is saved, what happens? Himself and his family, the following generations, they don't do much better, right? Then you get to Genesis 11, you have humankind again rebelling against God. He told them to spread out and, and multiply over the face of the earth. What do they do? They gather. They try to build this tower to the heavens. This tower to their own greatness. God, uh, God uh, ultimately, He confuses their language. Then they disperse over the face of the earth. Then you pick up in Genesis 12 and you have Abram or Abraham. And, and, and now we see this new beginning. God is promising that he is going to be faithful to Abraham and to his family. So God calls Abram to begin a new people, the people of God, Israel. And so God prospers Abraham and he leads the people of God. And so there's this new beginning. And now through, a and through Isaac and Jacob and Joseph, the people of God, they are small, but they're growing. Ultimately, you get to the end of Genesis and you see this famine that causes them to go to Egypt. Exodus picks up at where, the, where Genesis left off. So Exodus opens the people of God. They become quite a big multitude. But they're not in the land that God promised them. They're in a foreign land. They then become enslaved. And then Moses leads them out. God saves them from their slavery. They go to Mount Sinai. He says, I will be your God. You will be my people. And I have saved you miraculously from Egypt. And so here is my law to follow. And along with that law can be kind of summed up in the Ten Commandments. Then you get on to Joshua and Judges. So God has given them the law. The people are disobedient, though. And so they wander in the wilderness for 40 years. But then it's now time for them to enter the Promised Land. So they enter. You have the period of Judges where you have these judges that are ruling over them. But at the very end of the book of Judges, well, Judges isn't a very good period in Israel's history, right? They continue to spiral into sin. They're not getting better. They're in the land. There are a multitude but they're not following the Lord faithfully. They continue this downward spiral into sin. But at the very end of Judges, you see that there is this need. There's this need. Gen uh, Judges 21 verse 25. They need a king. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. See that? There's this need for a king. Then in 1 Samuel and first, through 1 first Kings, uh, this king is first of all Saul, then it's David, then it's Solomon. So the kingdom is established. David uh, uh, unites the tribes that become the kingdom of Israel. And then it's expanded on. The kingdom is expanded through Solomon. Solomon builds a temple. It's the home of the Ark of the Covenant. It's going to be the center of the people's worship in Jerusalem. Well, what happens after Solomon dies? Well, the kingdom's divided. So you have 1st King, 1st and 2nd Kings all the way through to the end of the Old Testament now. First king through the prophets. First second kings through the prophets. So after Solomon dies, the kingdom's divided. So you have the northern kingdom of Israel, then you have the southern kingdom of Judah. 
Almost every single one of these kings are bad. And so God, all throughout the prophets, He's sending them prophets to call them to repentance, saying, you have been unfaithful to keep this covenant. I have saved you, but you are being unfaithful to what I have called you to do, to warn them of judgment that's coming. Remember, Deuteronomy said what? They will be blessed if they follow the Lord, if they're obedient, but they will be cursed for their disobedience. But their idolatry only gets worse. Eventually, Assyria comes and destroys the northern kingdom of Israel in 722 B.C. Then Babylon destroys Judah in 597 through 586. And then there's a number of waves of exile. The people are carried off to foreign lands. The temple is destroyed in 586. And there's survivors then. Survivors who are carried off into exile, they go into exile for 70 years. We have the book of Daniel, right? Uh, they're in exile. A remnant then, after 70 years, returns to Jerusalem. So think of like Haggai. They rebuild the temple. Think of Ezra and Nehemiah. The, but Israel is still longing for the glory it had in the day. They're still longing for more. That's the story of the Old Testament. Did you get it all? Everything from Genesis to Malachi happens within that story. But there's a major issue. The Old Testament is a story without an enemy. You have the people of God longing for what they used to have. They are out of exile, yes, at the end of the Old Testament. They're out of exile physically. But there's still a spiritual understanding of exile. They're out of exile physically, but they're still in exile spiritually. They're, they're longing for deliverance. The, the messianic hope of a deliverer, of a savior, has not been fulfilled. So then what does this mean for us? Understanding the overall story of the Old Testament, the themes of the Old Testament, how to read it, helps us read the New Testament in color. Turn with me real quick to Matthew 27. In Matthew 27... Verse 50 through 51. Show you why the Old Testament is important. In Matthew 27, Jesus is crucified. Matthew writes, 27, verse 50. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. He dies on the cross. Verse 51. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split. Big deal. The curtain is torn. What does that mean for us? The curtain is torn in two. What's the big deal with this cloth tear? Well, the curtain is in the temple. And this curtain separated the holy place. The temple had different sections. It separated the holy place from the most holy place. The most holy place was symbolic of where God's throne on earth was. Where His presence was. Dwelt. And only once a year the high priest could go into the temple, could enter the temple and offer sacrifice on the Day of Atonement. Once a year could they enter the presence of God. But the curtain now is torn. And now it shows us that that separation between God and man is gone. Through the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ on behalf of sinners, through His death, the curtain is torn. We now have access through faith to God. Now all who through faith in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we are able to access God. Not once a year, but continually. How do we know that? How do we know the importance of that? How do we read that in color? Well, understanding the background of the Old Testament, that they weren't allowed into the presence of God. And now, even right now, this very instance, we can enter into God's presence. Or, or think about John chapter 1, verse 29 where John the Baptist sees Jesus and he says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. What does that mean? Well, unless we understand all of, all, all, all of what the Passover Lamb, the sacrifices of the Old Testament being a symbolic and substitutionary sacrifice of a Lamb dying in their place symbolically for their sins, that helps us see exactly what Christ's sacrificial and substitutionary death does for us. It takes away our sins. And we don't understand that if we don't understand the sacrifices of the Old Testament. And they are fulfilled in Jesus. So having a grasp of the Old Testament helps us understand the New Testament. Helps us put our Bible together. It helps us understand the, the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why we need Him. Why we must place our faith in Him. What He has done to save us from our sins. Now, 
I did not mention one major theme of the Old Testament. Did it deliberately? And that theme is Jesus. Though the Old Testament does not explicitly mention Jesus by name, but it all points to Him. Remember that theme of the Messiah, the hope of the Old Testament, the hope for salvation, the hope for restoration, the hope for relationship with God is found in Jesus. It culminates in Him. It is fulfilled in Him. All of the Old Testament is pointing to Christ. I don't mean that you look for Christ under every rock in the Old Testament, but, but when we're reading the Old Testament, we're like reading the first book of a series of a story that is not finished. A story that points us to the Son of God who left the glories of heaven, who came and He lived a sinless life, who died on the cross and rose from the dead. And Jesus died that sacrificial death, the death that all of the sacrifices of the Old Testament point to. He rose from the dead showing that Jesus has all authority, showing that His priesthood and that His kingship is eternal. It's all pointing to him. In fact, Jesus tells us that in Luke 24. Some of you know that this section of Scripture is, is really my favorite chapter in all of the Bible. Uh, because you have the resurrection of Jesus at the very beginning, and then you have his appearance to the disciples. Look, look at what Jesus says about himself from the Old Testament here. Jesus said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken prophets of the Old Testament, was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into His glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, He interpreted, interpreted meaning He explained to them in all the Scriptures the things concerning Himself. See that? Jesus is saying, it's all pointing to me. Moses and the prophets, to the major sections of the Old Testament, and He's saying the sum of it all is pointing to me. Skip on down to verse 44. He said, then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the Law of Moses, the Prophets, and Psalms. Okay, so now every major genre, every major section of the Old Testament must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the Scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and repentance and forgiveness, and repentance for the forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. In other words, he's saying it's all pointing to him. Mm -hmm. The Old Testament is not a bunch of stories of fables and silly myths. It's not about you daring to be a Daniel or being brave like David facing your giants. No, it's a story. The story. The old, old story. The story of beginning. The story of fall into sin. The story of the God who created all. Who, who, but who loves us and spared not His Son, His only Son, to save us from our sins. All pointing to Him. So what's the point? What's the point of, of, of that passage we read in 2 Kings 2? What's the point of Elisha and his youth that are mauled by these bears? As much as I'd like to claim that as my life verse, that if you make fun of my bald head, you'll be judged. <laughs> That's not the point. <laughs> No, no, no. The, the point is it shows us that those who speak against the Lord's anointed. Elisha was a prophet of God. He was commissioned by God to bring the word of God to the people. It shows that those who speak against the Lord, they're actually mocking God himself. Those youths, yes, they're mocking Elisha, but they're ultimately mocking God. They're mocking the prophet of God. He brought the word of God and they were judged. In other words, what they had done is they had rejected the Lord's anointed. They turned their backs on God and they were judged for their sins. My friends, you and me and every single one of us who's ever lived, we will be judged for our sins. We will have to stand before God one day. But know this, that there was a Lamb of God who was slain and who took your punishment for you so that you would not have to stand before God and face His righteous wrath against your sin. But that you could stand before Him as His very own child. And so that's the story. The story of hope. The story of longing for redemption. That the New Testament will pick up on. And we'll see you next week. Let's pray. Father, as we 
come to you. It's incredible that we get to be in your presence. Why would you allow us as sinful people to even be alive? It's incredible that you didn't wipe us all out from the very beginning. But yet you love us, you care about us, you care for us. Spare not your only son for us. What truly remarkable good news that is. Lord, help us to understand your word. Father, fill us with your spirit to, to better understand and apply your word to our lives. Uh, I pray that we would be a people who don't just say we like your, love the, your word or love the Bible. And, but Lord, who, who genuinely read it. And do it. Who, who, who see the, the beauty and the majesty of who you are. Father, may we be people who don't move on from this first major section of the Bible. But who commit our lives to study. So that we can know you better. So that we can see Christ for the, 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 the majesty of who he is. Father, we thank you and we praise you for this word that you have given to us. We thank you that you have revealed yourself to us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.